Welcome back. Last time we discussed what cadence is and why we need a PDK to start designing our own chips. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up your computer so you can get started working with cadence yourself. But before we really get started with that, it's important to know that we're not going to install cadence on our own computer like we would with a web browser or any other program on our computer. Instead, we're going to run Cadence on one central server and connect to that server and do the work on there. And there are two very important reasons for that. The first reason would definitely be security. You see, those PDKs we discussed last time are always bound on the very heavy non-disclosure agreements, meaning that it is not allowed to leak any of those files to anyone who is not in an NDA with the provider of those files. And thus, it's very important that those files can leak without any supervision. Now, if you would work at a company with, let's say, 100 employees, each one of them would have a copy of Cadence on their computer and a copy of the PDK. It would be very hard to detect if one of those important files would leak to someone who is not under an NDA with the foundry. And thus, it's much easier to keep the files secure if they're all on the same server. In that case, if one of the files is leaked, you can just find it on the logs of that specific server. The second reason has to do with the length of our simulations. In this particular video series, we're going to make very simple circuits, so they will take maybe 10 seconds to run at most. But once you start making circuits that rely on maybe hundreds or even thousands of transistors at the same time, these simulations will take much longer to run, sometimes even in the order of days or weeks, or if you're in really bad luck, months. So it would be very inconvenient if you would have to keep your computer on at all times to keep that simulation running. Instead, we can now just start the simulation, leave the connection with the server, let it run in the background, and then come back later when the simulation is done without having to keep your computer on at all times. Before we get started, it's important to know that you do need an active internet connection to the local network of the university. If you are not currently at the university, you can also use a VPN connection to the TUE. And if you need help with setting up one of those connections, there's a link in the description that can help you with that. Let's get started. First, we need to install a program called X2Go that allows us to make the connection to the server. How you do this depends a bit on the operating system you're running, but there is a link in the description that can help you with that. It's to the wiki of X2Go, and it contains descriptions of how to do this on Windows, Mac OS, and a variety of Linux distributions. Once you're done installing X2Go, we can start configuring it. Open the X2Go client and click on this button, the white piece of paper with a star in its corner. That allows you to create a new so-called session with X2Go. And that will open a window that looks like this. Now, don't worry, there are a lot of text boxes in here, but you only have to fill it out once, and once you're done, you don't have to do it ever again for that specific connection. Now, let's give this session a nice recognizable name. Let's call it Advanced CMOS, for example. We then need to fill out the URL of the server that we're going to use. Due to security reasons, we're not going to share the URL of the server with you in this video. It will be provided to you in the course Advanced CMOS Design. At the login box, type in your S number if you're a TUE student, or your TUE username if you're an employee. For the SSH port, we're going to use the value of 22, and for the session type, we can choose XFCE. With all of this filled out, we're done with the authentication part of the X2Go configuration. With this, you should technically be allowed on the server. You will be asked to fill out your TUE password when logging in though, and if you are working on a PC that you trust, that might be a bit annoying if you have to do that every time. There is a way you can set up passwordless entry on your PC, and I've linked to a page on the X2Go wiki in the description for a more lengthy description of how you can set that up. If you're going to connect with the server quite regularly, I highly recommend you do this because this will save you a lot of time in the long run. Next, we can go to the connection tab to tell X2Go a bit more about the internet connection between us and the server. If we have a very stable connection, we can slide the slider to LAN, which is the fastest allowed connection, or a bit lower if our connection is a bit more spotty. Um, the second part of this section describes the compression method that we're going to use. Think of the server as something like a streaming service. It's going to send you video images 
of how the desktop of your server is going to look. And thus the compression method tells you how efficient the video will be compressed. The more efficient the video is compressed, the less bandwidth is needed, but also the worse it's going to look. You can choose for a compression method that allows for high visual clarity. In our particular case, let's go with 512 JPEG, but feel free to experiment with this. Just note that the less compression you apply to the image, so the higher the quality, also the more bandwidth you're going to require from the server, and that might impact your colleagues because we're all connecting to the same server. So keep that in mind. Now we can go to the input output tab where we can first set up the size of a window. We can go for example for a full screen window or a window with a particular resolution. And if you have multiple monitors, you can even have the extra window span across multiple monitors using this checkbox. For the clipboard mode, I would personally recommend choosing bidirectional copy and paste. That allows you to control C or copy something from the local PC to the extra go window or vice versa, making it very easy to exchange information between the two computers. On the keyboard, the setting auto detect keyboard settings works for most people. If you find out that the, your keyboard isn't detected properly when working with X2Go, then you can choose one of these bubbles to change the options. Let's then move on to the media tab, which tells you about settings for sound and printing support. Now, because we're not going to watch videos or listen to music, feel free to disable sound and we can also disable printing support because there is no printer connected to the server at all. Finally, the shared folders tab allows you to set up a folder on your local PC, which is then also seen on the X2Go window, so on the server. And that allows you to save something in that folder on the server and then automatically show up on your local PC. So it makes exchanging files very easy. To do that, select a folder like this, then click on the Add button and make sure to check this little checkbox to ensure that it's auto-mounted on the desktop of X2Go. Having done all that, we're done with setting up our session. We can just click OK over here and then double click on the session that we've just created. This will ask you for your password, type it in, and then after a while you should see something like this. Now please bear in mind that if this is the first time you're going to connect with the server, this might take one or two minutes, but eventually you should see a window like this. If this is indeed what you're seeing, congratulations, you've set up the connection to the server. If you want to leave the connection with the server, there are multiple methods for doing that. You can go to the applications menu in the corner of the screen and then click on log out twice. A more convenient method in my opinion would be to use the shortcut Alt tab on your keyboard, which will then allow you to switch to the X2Go window and then press on the pause or stop button to uh, pause your session or entirely terminate your session with the server. Great, so now we have a working connection to the design server on which Cadence runs. Next time, we're going to take our first steps working with Cadence and look in particular at the library manager. See you then.